I guess did the uh, early success go to your head early on in your career at all, or? Uh, the success didn't go to my head. Uh, what went to my head, well, I, I tell you, I was really cocky. I mean, I, it really surprised me when Flair wrote his book and to, talked about, you know, the insecurity that he had because I would have, nobody would have ever guessed that. Right. And I didn't have any insecurity. I have, I had an overabundance of confidence. And I mean, I, there's several times when I'd walked into the dressing room and, you know, slid my bag across the floor and I would say, you know, lace them up tight tonight, guys. I'm here to take somebody's job. I was cocky, but I, I, it, it, I was cocky about being good. I wasn't, you know, the success, the, the money and stuff didn't go to my head. It, what went to my head was how easy that the, how easy that the wrestling had, how easy that the wrestling had came to me. And I, look, this is gonna piss a lot of people off, but I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn. I mean, you know, if you want to judge me, judge me from bell to bell when I was in my prime, man. Nobody can judge me. I mean, you know, look, at the bottom, of, there's some assholes that said, uh, well, Buddy over and overrates himself and overinflates himself. Look, I was 23 years old wrestling the world heavyweight champion. I was the one that screwed it up. You know, it wasn't because of my lack of talent, you know. And back then when I was wrestling Flair, it was when, you know, you had to put asses in the seats. And when you drew money, they give you the ball and you run with it. So I'm not overinflate. I'm not overrating myself. What about uh, I guess let's let's talk about the partying and stuff like that, and, and, and I guess the groupies. What was the road like back then in terms of uh, the groupies and uh, the partying? What was the road like? <laughs> uh, well, they they were there. <laughs> I mean, it was. I mean, they were there for you know. What had a better uh, ring rat population now, Memphis or Mid South, or were they pretty much all equal? Uh, they were all equal. I mean, they they were all equal. There, I mean, there was girls ever. There was never a shortage of girls. Sheik and I had uh, we were sharing a room over in uh, over in Hawaii, and uh, I wasn't going to stay up late that night, and I left the uh, the the light on to the uh, to the bathroom, and uh, I was laying in bed. And, and it was dark in the room except for the light in the bathroom and I heard the door open and it was the Sheik. Well, I saw the Sheik's silhouette come by and then all of a sudden it was like Eclipse and I thought he had turned the light out and then all of a sudden the light was back on and uh, he had had this like 400 pound girl huh. to come in the room with him and uh, you know, you could hear the mattress when she sat on the bed, you could hear the mattress uh, screaming. Huh. And uh, they left the bathroom light on, so the only thing I could see, like a silhouette, like he was karate chopping her or something. I didn't know what the hell was going on, so I fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, she was gone, and uh, I went and opened the curtains up trying to get the sheik up, and uh, uh, there was blood all over the place. I mean, there was blood. It looked like Helter Skelter. There was, like, blood all over the wall uh, uh, and, uh, you know, on the ceilings and everything, and... Apparently this girl was on her period and whatever they were doing that night uh, Anyway, she got on the airplane the next morning. He had blood on his mustache and blood, dried blood on his fingernails and oh. eyebrows and it's nasty. I love JJ. JJ tried so hard to keep me straight, man. Now we were all partying. Now let me tell you something, brother. Don't let none of them bastards fool you. And don't let nobody tell you that they wasn't doing the dope and partying and the same bullshit I was. They're, they're liars. Because everybody was doing it. And I'm not trying to expose their life or expose the business. But everybody was doing it. But J.J. tried so hard to keep me out of trouble, man. I'll never forget. I uh, I, I met this girl at, uh, in West Virginia. And she, was, uh, she had actually won the Miss West Virginia beauty pageant. How do I know? because she come and she had the sachet on and the crown from the pageant. And uh, JJ and I was, I remember after, uh, after the matches, uh, JJ always used to order a Domino's pizza and he would watch that George Scott, that uh, he would watch George Scott, that preacher on TV. And uh, me and that girl was walking out of the, that, me and that girl, that girl and I were, Miss West Virginia and I was walking out of the bar and JJ, he walked out of the bar going, Nature Boy, where's my Nature Boy? And the only thing he had on him was a Do Not Disturb sign around <laughs> his pecker, man. 
as he was buck naked and he had a do not disturb sign around his thing. It was hilarious, but uh, I love JJ. He, uh, he he was always good to me. Can you talk about your drug problems over your career and uh, how you started and you know how many times you tried to stop? How, how did that all come about? Uh, well, it, it just started uh, where uh, it just started, you know, the long trips and stuff. You need something to keep awake and. You know, and uh, cocaine was my deal, and uh, you know I just got where I like it, and had a love affair with it, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're like I said, everybody was doing it where some guys could, uh, you know, some guys could, uh, you know, do it and go to bed and have a family life and do all that. I'd pass my house up and stay out and party, and I was nonstop with it, and uh, you know, it just bad turned to worse. And what year do you think you started? Oh, I don't know, 83, 84, something like that. Right. So pretty much just carried on to the different territories yeah. that you worked for. Yeah. How, how many times uh, do you think you tried to stop? Uh, every time I did it. Right. Yeah, yeah. I just wasn't ready to stop, you know. There was a legend behind my drug use. Now, I remember hearing the story, I don't know how true it is, that they were supposed to put this strap on you. And uh, I think Crockett or Barnett maybe called you up in a hotel room. What had happened was they were shoot. They were going to shoot the. Uh, they were going to shoot the program. Uh, they were shooting the program with. Uh, 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 they were going to put Baby Doll with me, and uh, JJ was going to go with, uh, with I believe Tully, and uh, when I was national heavyweight champion, and Flair was going to take time off. Somebody. Somebody told me that his wife had a miscarriage. I don't know. And listen, you know, a lot of people say this is bullshit. I'm just telling you what I was told. Now, Ver Dusty can verify this because Dusty's the one that told me this was what was going to happen. And I don't see why it's that big of a stretch for people to believe. I mean, Flair and I were doing record business that in 50 years of Jim Crockett promotions, nobody... Flair had never drawed that kind of money over there with anybody and everybody he had worked with. And everybody's from 1935 to 1985, nobody had ever drawn the money that Flair and I had drawn. Okay? So why is it a big stretch to say that they were going to put the strap on me for a day, a week, a month? What, what Where's the stretch at? Right, right. The fuck? I mean, you know, what's the deal? So people can believe it if they want to. If they don't, I don't give a tinker's damn. But uh, I was supposed to uh, shoot. We were shooting, going to shoot the angle that day, and I'd overslept. I took, I uh, you know, got high that night. Took a bunch of volumes and fell asleep, and I didn't feel like getting up. And Dusty called me, and and uh, uh, I hung up on him. And then Crockett had called me and told me to get my ass down to the TV station. I told him don't fucking bother me, and I hung up on him. Twelve o'clock when I finally wound up showing up, Dusty walked up to me and said, "Give me the belt. You don't have a job no more." Wow. So here. Huh. Looking back, do you think that's pretty much one of your biggest regrets of all, of, of your career in the business? Or I didn't have any regrets, man. I had a hundred grand in the bank. I mean, you know, Watts told me, you know, Bill Watts told me, when you have a hundred grand in the bank, you do whatever you want to do. If you don't want to do something, don't do it. Right. I mean, I don't mean to be cocky and be a, you know, be am, uh, ambivalent about it, uh, but I mean, it's, you know, it's what happened. Hey, it helped shape me and who I was. I mean, we wouldn't be sitting here talking if I didn't do some of the crazy shit that I'd done in my life, right? That's true. The time that, uh, 1986, when uh, Crockett fired me after the belt deal. Right. Uh, and I, they had actually sent me to Memphis to dry out. But when I went to Memphis to dry out, I got hooked up with this guy. And uh, he was the biggest cocaine dealer in uh the Southwest, uh, I, I'm not going to mention his name, but he's he, he did a lot of prison time. But anyway, uh, there was, uh, I had loaned him a pistol. He had gotten to some trouble and I'd loaned him a gun. Well, I didn't know he was a convicted felon. And I was coming out of my mom and dad's house and the U.S. Marshals came up to me and asked me if I was Buddy Landell. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, you know, we got to, you know, you got to fly down to the grand jury in Oxford, Mississippi. And. What had happened inadvertently was uh, this guy had got busted for 33 kilos uh, of cocaine and machine guns and all kinds of stuff. And when they busted him, my my pistol was with him and they did the serial numbers and he was a convicted felon and he wasn't supposed to have a weapon. That I was just supposed to go to testify why that, you know, that I, uh, 
why that uh, he had my pistol. Of course, right. I tried to lie. This is the FBI, man. They had me in the FBI office uh, yeah, before the grand jury. And not only me, but they had me and Jerry Lee Lewis, the country singer, and the sheriff of, huh. of that of that town. So all, we were all three sitting there. Wow. And so Jerry Lee Lewis is nervous, and so was I. And, and uh, so the uh, FBI, I'll never forget it, a little redhead FBI guy come up to me, and he said, uh, now, how did he get your pistol? I said, well, I don't know. Somebody must have stole it and give it to him. I said, I don't know how he got it. I said, I barely know the guy. <laughs> he said, well, before you, I'm going to ask you one more time before you answer it. He goes, I want to show you something. And he turned the light out and put this projector movie on. And it's me and, me and the guy was going down the road in his Cadillac snorting coke, you know. And, wow. And so, I mean, they'd been watching him for a long time, and I didn't know that. And, That's uh, crazy. So, anyway, I sang my song, and that that's all they wanted. Wow.